Okay. So welcome everyone. Uh, today for the last colloquium of the spring uh, 2021 Half-Baked series, we are very pleased to host uh, Thea Kortetmaki. Uh, Thea is a, a, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Jyväskylä in Finland. Her work uh, focuses on just food system transition and more broadly on the contemporary challenges that environmental ethics poses to ethical and political theory. Despite her status of uh, a young researcher, she has already produced uh, an impressive number of important articles on this topic. And today, her talk, as you can see, is titled Just Food System Transition, Philosophical Underpinnings. So thank you, Thea, for uh, joining us today. And the floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me. And giving me this opportunity to present my work. I'm also at the kind of stage of looking for new interdisciplinary collaborations. So this is really uh, valuable for me. And I'm also really uh, looking forward to hear any thoughts and comments on this uh, issue that I consider really important, but yet uh, theoretically in its infancy and therefore uh, requiring lots of lots of um, future work. And um, so I will today focus quite much on political philosophy and um, food ethics and food justice. And I approach them with a kind of empirically strongly informed and interdisciplinary manner, um, which is probably also evident in this presentation. So to kind of contextualize um, the situation first, we all know the really, really severe situation concerning climate change and how it's going to impact, impact our planet on different ways. And for example, Bill McKibben actually uh, says that uh, climate change is actually shrinking the planet because larger and larger areas are becoming inhabitable and unusable for anything, anything that could be of, of value. And in this context, uh, food system activities, um, including, for example, food supply chains activities from farm to fork and all the related social, cultural and political uh, phenomena are really central because first of all, if we consider uh, human-made greenhouse gas emissions, at least a quarter of them, but even more than a third, depending on how you, how you calculate and uh, determine system boundaries. But this much of those greenhouse gas emissions are related to food system activities. So food is among the major sources for climate, climate impacts. Food production is also a major driver for biodiversity loss through land use impacts. And in addition, in environmental terms, food system activities and especially primary production uh, significantly uh, degrade uh, fresh water availability and quality, cause eutrophication and cause ocean acidification. So, even though food is crucially important to us, the current way of producing, processing, and consuming it uh, can't continue the way it's done, done at the moment. And this is uh, kind of the background where we have established this Just Food project where I'm currently working in. It's a six-year project uh, funded by the Finnish Academy and Strategic Research Council, where we, uh, the aim is to address uh, difficult global and local challenges and find, find solutions to them in an interdisciplinary way. It's kind of funny that we have just even in the title of our project, but I'm actually the only philosopher in the project. So uh, other, other researchers are food system researchers, or environmental nutritional scientists and so on. And we work to kind of bring together these food system studies and empirical findings with justice related research. And from the justice, justice side, we 
have to incorporate both um, theorizing and philosophical work on justice, but also the perceptions of justice from those stakeholders um, who are working, for example, in food system and who now should transform their practices to more sustainable. So through this kind of um, interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary constellation, we try to provide concepts and criteria for just transition, uh, practical solutions for the, the fairness in the transition and policy recommendations for this work. But now to kind of uh, explain what this just transition basically means and then to go deeper in the questions, it, races in, in the food context. When we think about the present state of affairs, um, we first of all, we have this situation that um, Brian Barry has called actually existing unsustainability. And we also have all actually existing injustices. So the present state of the non-ideal world, so to say. And now we have to combine this present state of affairs with the urgency of environmental sustainability and low carbon transition in the food systems. So this, this creates a sense of urgency and seriousness of this uh, complex task. And for thinking about food justice and justice in this uh, environmental and low carbon transition, we actually need to ask what kind of approach to thinking about food justice is most important. And Brian Barry has suggested uh, in this environmental context more broadly that it is uh, more important to address injustice than aim to develop a positive theory of justice. And this is actually uh, kind of contradictory to the mainstream of philosophizing justice, where the aim to create positive, positive theory of justice and the ideal um, uh, situation is, has often been the main task. And we are really facing a big challenge here because um, this this citation is from the kind of energy related low carbon transition, but the same could be said about food system. So when we think about the just transformation of such a system, um, this transformation is also a decision to live in a different type of society, not simply a low carbon version of the current one. So we are not just, um, making minor improvements in the present food systems. But we really need to think about how our food systems could operate and how they need to be transformed in this respect. So why does actually justice in transition and transition here basically refers to this low carbon transition in food systems. Why does justice matter? Because uh, when we think about uh, traditional climate justice literature that is really huge and established, um, climate justice literature emphasizes that transition is necessary to prevent climatic injustices and to ameliorate the previous harm. So based on this, any kind of low carbon transition basically does something good and tries to reduce injustices, tries to remediate um, climate injustice and so on. So isn't it just uh, enough and good that we have and try to make this kind of low carbon transition happen? Uh, unfortunately, not. Because this low carbon transition itself in the food systems, for example, may impact unjustly in many ways. First of all, it influences material distribution of goods and bads and may do so unjustly. It may hamper achieved statuses, relations, and rights. Um, it may undermine enjoyed opportunities that would be important from justice viewpoint. And it also seriously challenges some of the existing cultural patterns and values. 
and these all may cause uh, justice related problems. I will uh, later present some concrete details about these as examples. So basically, there will be winners and losers in the low carbon transition and the process of reducing emissions. And those who are presently disadvantaged may actually lose most, while the already fortunate groups gain most. So there is a risk that climate action in food system accumulates disadvantages and advantages, and this would be um, systematically unjust. Therefore, justice in the transition matters. And just to highlight some points about these differences to conventional context of theorizing justice, which means that we can't simply apply the much tested um, keystone works on justice and social justice and environmental justice here. It's not that simple, uh, but rather we actually need non-ideal theoretical approaches. And we have to acknowledge that justice is, is not a standalone concept. It is actually a concept that needs to be empirically informed and needs to be addressed in interdisciplinary ways. Uh, first of all, when we think about justice in low carbon transition of food systems, the starting point is nothing like timeless um, or universal or some kind of tabula rasa where we can, uh, where from we can start to reason about what would a fully just system look like. The definition of just transition basically excludes this kind of timeless nature that is often present in uh, conventional approaches to justice. We are dealing with a process where time is actually one of the central factors and the urgency of climate action. And justice in transition is not about some kind of um, in state or outcome that um, would be just um, if it was evaluated without references to process or time. Um, this means that there could be some kind of end state that uh, is itself just but if it has been achieved in ways that are fundamentally unjust or involve violations of rights, for example, then there is a problem in the process itself. Uh, many approaches to justice uh, focus on evaluating one uh, situation, one state or whatever state, um, saying that what is just now or is, is the society just at this moment? Or would the society be just if it could be characterized as this? But just transition um, it, it instead focuses on all the time constantly evolving and changing process that actually starts from very unjust and unsustainable premises. And that creates kind of really messy theoretical starting point in, in my view. So, to sum up, these temporal and non-ideal considerations are at the core of just transition thinking. And um, furthermore, just to point out that just transition is strongly linked to a political discourse. Actually, just transition claims first um, a rose as claims by labor unions. And it has been uh, now a really strong political rhetorical tool uh, that has been discussed, for example, in the EU quite much, um, and also in empirical research. And therefore, against uh, these facts, it's really kind of alarming that there is basically, I would say, no philosophical work on clarifying the conceptualization, conceptualization of just transition. There are some papers that have um, clarified this conceptualization, but uh, they haven't approached it on philosophical or ethical grounds. They have just basically brought together different interesting aspects without this kind of critical um, critical analytical lens and therefore there is a risk that just transition becomes to mean 
anything anywhere. And I, I find that uh, therefore it would be really important to bring the philosophical contribution here. So now to go more concretely to issues of food justice in just transition. Um, to start with the theoretical core that there is uh, any case, just transition literature has adopted a uh, relational and three-dimensional or equivalent uh, framework of justice um, that has been used in environmental justice by David Schlossberg, especially and first and then uh, after him by many other authors. And in this framework of justice, there are three dimensions of um, justice that I will go deeper next. So there is distributive, procedural, and recognition justice. And food justice literature and research has also become to utilize these uh, dimensions, for example, um, Erin Gilson's and Sarah Kenehan's uh, uh, nice collection about food and climate justice um, utilizes these dimensions really much. And um, however, it should be understood that this uh, framework is not an exhaustive or positive definition of justice in any way. It is rather an analytical framework that clarifies and distinguishes different aspects of justice and therefore he helps kind of uh, make sense uh, of uh, their differences and how they are linked. So what is the origin of the basic tensions that uh, arise in the context of food system climate action and just transition in food systems. Um, these basic tensions arise from the unsustainabilities and injustices that there are already um, in the present system. However, problematically, the continuation of those unsustainabilities and injustices also contributes to the creation and delivery of justice promoting goods and outcomes. In other words, there are, there are lots of activities that provide uh, basic necessities uh, like food and nutrition and livelihoods to people. And those same activities are now problematic from the justice and sustainability viewpoints. So, um, but this also means that addressing them, for example, arguing that some of them should be simply uh, Run down, run down and um, stopped means that we are claiming that some activities that contribute to production of livelihoods and basic necessities should actually be stopped. And uh, therefore, food injustices actually are often a case of structural injustice. So it is not about someone doing something that could be blamed as clearly unjust or wrong. It is basically all people doing things that are considered normal and acceptable in our uh, common reasoning, but yet uh, activities that in overall terms together produce and reproduce those injustices. And that also means that it's really uh, difficult to address them. So now to go to those uh, three dimensions and um, their uh, related tensions and problems in making food systems climate, climate smart and low carbon. Um, first of all, we have distributive justice that refers to uh, the distribution of material and immaterial goods. And in this context, uh, in these aspects, there is a basic tension between social justice and climate, change, climate action related aims in food systems. So the, the problem um, actually, how would I say it, is that um, this justice promoting goods that are relevant to social justice, like um, basic needs and livelihoods, now have impacts that contradict um, with climate aims. 
And in this distributive aspect, we first of all need to consider food security and the possibility of all people to achieve sufficient uh, nutrition. It is, of course, uh, of utmost importance when we consider justice, but yet it is very unclear what are the implications of this food security viewpoint for, for example, food prices or regarding, for example, food preferences, that is the availability of different foods. A couple examples of problems related to just transition in this regard. Uh, first, um, many climate activities that uh, would reduce emissions relate to pricing carbon and greenhouse gas emissions. But because food systems activities and food production is one of the most significant source of uh, climate emissions, it would very probably mean increased price of food. And therefore, uh, then the food security of low income households would possibly be compromised. Another example, uh, we know that um, approximately half of the climate emissions of food system are related to livestock keeping. Um, so, how should we approach the issue that basically the climatic viewpoint would actually suggest that we should uh, make red meat uh, cost really, really much to reduce its consumption or actually simply uh, run down most of the production? Um, but how would this influence the opportunity of people to enjoy a culturally appropriate diet? It raises uh, attention in this respect too. The second um, aspect regarding distribution is uh, really difficult. It's, it's the, what I call the local dilemma and livelihood impacts, because of course, uh, having the opportunity to secure your livelihoods is very important for social justice. And this is also why uh, many food justice groups have strongly embraced local food because by supporting local food, you support local livelihoods and um, thereby food justice and social justice. However, uh, there are many, many regions in Europe, for example, where I, I live, 80% of local food production is related to uh, livestock keeping. And from the climatic viewpoint, supporting this kind of production structure uh, goes totally against the climate objectives. Uh, so if there will be local food production, it should produce something totally different from what is being produced now. But if you simply support local livelihoods by buying the local food that is available now, it does not promote this kind of production and transformation in any way. Uh, and therefore, it may actually kind of stagnate the present uh, forms of production and slow down the needed transition to other crops. And um, finally, for various reasons, uh, if we think about where climate action needs to be done in the food systems, what needs to be changed? Uh, this transition pressure and transition demands, uh, they are unavoidably unjustly distributed. And one example of this uh, is, of course, this livestock keeping and animal production. It is re regionally distributed in different ways. And um, another example is, for example, peatlands and uh, organic soils that cause really much climatic emissions, but it's about kind of geographical luck or bad luck if you happen to be farming in uh, organic soils. So it's, uh, it's just a, a matter of luck how much this uh, target your activities if you are a farmer. So we can't avoid these kinds of uh, impacts. So there is a question how we should, for example, compensate these kinds of brute luck cases, and what are things that cannot be compensated? Um, 
shortly about procedural aspects, which basically mean um, kind of decision making processes and justice um, and fairness in those processes. Um, in the present food system, we can talk about procedural injustice because uh, there are lots of power disparities that um, preclude that prevent formal participatory equality. Um, and it's even when we have kind of formally equal opportunities of everyone to participate in decision making, there are lots of factors uh, that influence how powerful, powerful companies, for example, are heard while uh, low income farmers are not. So procedural fairness requires a chance to have a say and be heard and taken seriously. So, but this creates a tension between kind of the need to do urgent climate action and to create inclusive and fair policy processes. Because if you want to include more and more actors, actors and discuss these things uh, really seriously, um, it takes much more time. It brings to the table much more conflicts and ideas and interests. And it takes, uh, again, more time to resolve them uh, in a democratic way. So in terms of urgency, some kind of um, enlightened dictator dictatorship would be the most effective solution for climate action, but it would be fundamentally unjust. Another problem in this respect that is that uh, because of the existing misinformation and misperceptions among ordinary consumers, food democracy that um, resonates with justice may actually delay or obstruct climate transition. One example of this is that when people are asked about what causes food system related climate emissions, they highlight transportation and packaging, but these are among the least uh, significant factors. So this is, raises uh, really difficult tensions and also the question um, of what can and should be left to markets. Because as we now know, really much of the food related decision making is actually made into neoliberal markets. And again, it's those with economic power that have um, more votes therein. So um, there are lots of questions um, how to actually create more just decision making processes, but actually promote effective climate action with them, because these two do not necessarily go in hand, hand in hand. Even though pe people are interested in addressing climate change, they tend to have much, much weightier interests and these misperceptions. Third, we have recognition justice, uh, which refers to social cultural respect and um, equal kind of uh, consideration. And we all know how strong uh, social and cultural elements, food and eating involve. It is far more than technical or biological issue. And therefore the social cultural tensions in transition are difficult, uh, especially when research community is increasingly um, arguing that uh, Western diets should be transformed um, to much more plant-based and, and um, animal-based food consumption should be reduced. So this conflicts with many of the food traditions and values and valuations, conceptions of normal, and also traditional knowledges and practices. So among the tensions that arise here, we have, for example, the tension between consumer sovereignty, we often consider important, versus effective action, actually restricting climate bad choices. And we also have this idea that it would be uh, justice to recognize different food traditions and values. But what if those traditions and values involve uh, carbon intensive practices, 
how can we combine these? Uh, then we also have the need to kind of recognize and acknowledge the knowledge of food system actors. But what if those actors think that their activities cannot be harmful for climate, for example, or can't be kind of um, unsustainable? And then finally, we have the big question that I can't go here, but um, what about uh, role and status of non-human animals and nature? And is there a risk that in the course of climate action, we actually make animals invisible and instrumentalize them as kind of just uh, matters of dietary terminology or some kind of low carbon gene manipulation solutions and so on. Uh, so some of the open questions among very many here uh, include, for example, how we could determine principles and criteria for this kind of just transition. This is something that I am currently working in and uh, trying to produce. But it's really difficult question, what should be included in those criteria? And another interesting question is, for example, when we talk about this kind of restorative justice, um, what is restorative justice um, in just transition? Because when we do any kind of climate action, isn't that some kind of restoration of previous harms and wrongdoings already? So if climate action is restorative justice itself and causes then some further harm and injustice, is it kind of restoration of restoration or what that is happening here? And then we have this issue that is really hard in these non-ideal conditions is that how, how we can balance between cosmopolitan and local claims for justice. And finally, uh, how to integrate philosophy firmly in this interdisciplinary work. Um, I will now conclude with a couple of thoughts about methods in doing this kind of research. And um, so Brian Burry has said that one gets a very different form of theorizing when one begins from uh, where we are in conditions of injustice, rather than seeking to develop compelling and intellectually coherent but abstract benchmarks or criteria for justice. So the fundamental question is how we should start philosophical work from this non-ideal situation, which also draws on empirical facts and how big role can the empirical facts play? Uh, where is the kind of um, ideal companion companionship between philosophy and empirical work here? Um, another related uh, citation is that injustice has a different phenomenology from justice. So, it is actually a separate theoretical enterprise and injustice should take priority over justice. So this also raises the question of kind of um, relationship between applied ethics and this kind of high theory that tends to be about positive theories of justice, at least as I, I see it. Um, and I'm currently still struggling quite much with these ideas, as well as the very basic question, what, what can we say as universally as possible? Because it seems that there are always pluralistic understandings and conceptions of justice and um, competing valuations. Um, but I think that not all that can be left to kind of political negotiation, but philosophers should say something about the fundamental difference be between kind of just and unjust. Otherwise, it's going to be the dominance of the most powerful voices again. And that's simply reproduction of earlier injustices and unsustainability. 
So this is something I have been working on uh, with now for approximately two years and will continue my work with. And um, I will skip to this kind of detailed sorry, methodological questions at this point and end with this slide about how I think um, philosophers can and should actually take a role in sustainability research and discussion also regarding food system activities. Because philosophers with their expertise can, for example, clarify, broaden and narrow discussion um, where it is uh, fuzzy or too inclusive of different issues or exclusive of something, something important. Philosophers can also compare and evaluate different arguments and statements, and therefore consult and propose different solutions, contribute to discussions with uh, good arguments, clarifications, corrections, comparisons. And finally, philosophers are really good at asking and innovating important questions. That's why I think we are a really important um, group who should participate more actively in this discussion about sustainability actions and climate actions in the food system. Thank you.